Welcome back to Live with the Mod, the Poet, where we have the greatest guests and most powerful conversations. And today is no different, powered by Revolution of One. And today we got a very, very special guest on the program with us today. We got the author, we got the influencer, entrepreneur, artist, public speaker, the good brother Rob Hill Sr. on the program with us today. How you doing today, family? I'm doing awesome, brother. I am doing awesome. Thank you for that uh, loving intro uh, and the platform you built, man. I'm, I'm great. I'm great. Man, I really appreciate you coming on here and uh, um, spending a few moments with us and having a conversation with us. I'm I'm truly honored um, that you made time for us. And uh, I'm a really big fan of your work. Um, I've been seeing your content for years and years and years now. Never knew the man, but I'm very familiar with the content. Um, and it's been refreshing to um, just get updated on on everything from watching your interviews and just um, listening to your conversations. And um, I wanted to ask, you know, I, I, I've noticed that you haven't done a lot of interviews as of late. Um, and I wanted to ask you about privacy. And um, is it something that you really value at this point in your life? And um, if it is, is it something that has changed over time um, up until now? Certainly. Uh, certainly. Uh, and it's a few ways to answer that. Um, I think that I love what interviews can do as far as opening you up to a new audience, getting a chance to spread a message, um, getting a chance to advance your mission and talk about your purpose and, you know, show up and let people know a little bit more about the work and, uh, you know, the reason why you're here. Um, I do struggle with the need to do constant interviews because I'm also in process and I want mm. time to work. I want time to learn. I want time to be solely a student. I want time to um, discover and get things wrong. And I don't um, want to present as somebody who's just... Um, just doing it right all year long all you know it's like um privacy is important not because i'm ashamed of any flaws or errors it's mm. important because this is the only life i get and i really love it it's intimate it's it's everything and i and i i um i respect the people who choose a more transparent position right and i encourage them to keep that up as long as they can I've done that for some years. I've realized it's best for me in spurts. You know, mm. it's best for me um, in specific seasons. And I do know that when I'm in my writing season, I don't always want to share what I'm writing about. Um, and not, again, not for secrecy. It's just a choice that I explore as a student, right? And we, we all learn in our own methods, our own um, processes. So um, not doing the interviews, man. It was really just like, let me take a step back from mm. the presentation of this work. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Let me just take a step back from the presentation of this work and continue enjoying the substance and navigating it and learning the craft and submitting myself to the actual, you know, process. That's all, you know? And, uh, and I, I like, like how you made that. Good conversations, mm. right? It's not a, uh, what do men cheat? I mean, come on, man. You know, I would rather study the ways that make people faithful. Um, you know, so get. Mm. Yeah, I like how you made that distinction between privacy and uh, secrecy, because uh, it's definitely completely different. And um, I asked that question because it's something that I'm noticing in my own life. And um, it was a poem that I wrote. Um, and it was a. Uh, the story's never meant to be told. And um, I wonder how, I mean, I mean, and this kind of goes into my next question about, you know, you speaking about being in process and just talking about the process to, you know, get creative and get in that mode to write. Um, I'm going to ask the question separately because I don't want, because each question is important in itself. But since I started with the first one, I'm going to ask you, um, how do you decide which stories aren't meant to be told? And what stories I'd be told, because sometimes we have great stories, great experiences, different things like that. And they're so powerful and impactful, powerful conversations. And they're just not meant to be told. They're not meant to be shared. Like, you know, I, I have another podcast, Breaking the Machine, and and I have a lot of powerful conversations with my co-hosts off air that are way more powerful than the ones on air. But we can never have those conversations in public. It's just only meant for the people who are in the, that conversation. How do you decide 
what is meant for the people and what you keep to yourself? Well, it's all meant for, for uh, something outside of myself. Mm-hmm. Now, when we say to people, I do have the blessing to have a larger platform, but some mm-hmm. message might not reach them, but I am sharing them with my intimate daily community, right? Um, when I when you say how did how do I decide? I've resigned to trust myself, am I? And mm. I I know when I'm sharing from a place of maturity. I know when I'm sharing from a place of lightheartedness. I know mm. when from a place of knowing, right? And then I also know when I'm sharing from a better place. I know when I'm sharing from a um, repressed position. And and I'll use a specific story so we can put this in perspective. Um, I had a beautiful relationship, uh, professional not romantic or intimate, but a beautiful relationship with an author named Jazz Waters. She's powerful voice, you know, impacted hip hop, impacted pop culture, um, wrote at the highest levels of writing. And um, she's actually the only person I've ever written a book with, right? Uh, but she's a powerful storyteller. She could, she died, she died by suicide in June of 2020. Mm. Now, we had had, um, up until that point, we had had um, eight years of friendship and conversation and process and exploration and, you know, exchange of each other's stories and telling of each other's families. Because I wrote, you know, about 10 years of my life with her. So she she Mm. got some intimate, you know, access and, you know, that did things for her and her world as well. But I have not been able to share these stories Mm. And power and the revelations that have come from that relationship, because I just have not been ready. Mm. Granted, it has completely shifted my life and the way I approach summers, right? It's mm. shifted my daily writing decisions and so much in my world, but the essence of that sh- story, what she really meant, the things that I really learned, how the loss has impacted me now to this day. Um, the shift in that connection to the text and the work we did, these are is, is layered in a way that I have not been able to process. But we'll take another story, like maybe raising my son and the interaction with his mother and the, the um, influence of the court system, right? And, you know, the will of fatherhood and all these things, I'll share these stories, right? Um, not to say that I might not still have some active emotions, but to me, um, you know, some things are easier released and some things are better entirely processed. And I just give myself the the ability to vacillate between the two on whatever it is. Right. Um, but when you say, you know, how do I decide? I usually try to share things on a larger scale that have been, that it beyond me just thinking it's a jazzy sentence, mm. you know, uh, mm. because in my younger writing, I just wanted to make it snap, you know, I just wanted to, mm. like if it, if it could pierce, I would allow it to pierce. Mm. Right. And now, um, I'm less threatening with my sword because I realize like I'm not being attacked, you know, um, I want to mm. share, like, bring us together. Um, so it's just important to realize like the difference, you know, some of the lessons I learned can be dividers on a mass scale. And I've seen my words used that way, right? Like I've had men come up and say, man, you, you wrote something and she said it to me and then now I don't have that relationship. And, um, the idea has not been to, um, destroy good relationships with Mm. my father. Right. The idea has been to improve families Mm. with this work. So I I just got to be responsible, you know, and I'm learning, man, based off the results, based off the interaction with my readers, 
but also based off of my personal identity and who I know I want to be, you know? Mm-hmm. So hopefully that answered the question. It, it, yes, it absolutely did. Um, and uh, it's just powerful. It's just powerful. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and uh, really sorry for your loss, man. Uh, brother, I know how that is. Like I've, I've been through my fair share of um, tough experiences, somewhat similar, um, not quite as similar. And um, I wanted to ask you about the writing um, because you said that you've never collaborated on a book Mm -hmm. um, like that before. Um, Is, is that because writing is very personable for you? Is it something that's very intimate to you? Kind of somewhat similar to any other artists. Um, I know a lot of, some artists take more pride in, you know, less collaboration than others. Some, you know, value more collaboration. But what what made Jazz special for you to feel open to collaborating with, with her in that way? There was was a, it like less ego or? Yeah, we had already broken down certain barriers to where we really trusted the other, to be honest. Mm. Um, it wasn't like, oh, Jazz, read this and tell me I'm a good writer. For lack of better words, forget being a good writer. Mm. Feel this, you know? Mm. And that's all I cared about. And she cared about that the same way. Mm. And then throughout our yearly conversation, she said something one time. It was a lesson that she learned. And she was, you know, like three or four years older than me. And she said, not everything you need has to come from you. Mm. And... um, it was just so powerful because we try to take on so many things ourselves, right? And we try to, I guess, prove self sufficiency. I don't know. But um, I do know there was a certain point where I was honest with myself about my limits. And I respected the way she approached this craft so much that I could go to her and say, I face some personal limitations, limitations that I think you could help me get over. Right. What is the number that I could pay you so that we can do this process together? Mm. Right. Understanding, you know, time and availability and all of that. She told me the number. She told me what she wanted and we worked it out. I didn't approach her like, you know, you my homie. So we just got to automatically do this together. Um, and why haven't I collaborated as much? It's probably because I'm still young in my career. Right. Mm. And I wanted to do some things that that were my ideas and I couldn't really rely on anybody else to believe in them the same way. I couldn't really wait for people to understand like, no, there's an audience for this. There are people who are looking for these messages. There are spaces that we are welcome in, but we have to actually organize that. Like I, I you know, so it was, it wasn't like um, I could just write Toni Morrison or, or Terry McMillan and be like, Hey, I got some cool words. You want to read them? You mm-hmm. know, like you got to kind of carve a space for yourself and then collaboration because something that people want to do. Right. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't on my first book contact someone like jazz who was writing on this is us and had this story editing for Jim Carrey shows and then get her to write a book about my life. Right. It, I had to create some value, some equity in that story for her to even want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, writing is extremely intimate. Right. And with that, I have this friend who says, you you know, let everybody have access to your audience. Mm. Um, And I think that, you know, when you realize people trust a lot for a certain thing, people are relying on you for a certain messaging um, for me. And when I realized people relied on me for a certain thing, I wanted to be the best wife I could be. Right. Mm. Uh, I just, that's just some personal work, you know, to me. Mm. No, and, and and I can completely uh relate. Um I feel like I still gotta I definitely have to earn my keep and um just I'm new to the whole right well, I've been writing for a long time, uh since I was a child, but I'm actually working on my first two books now and it's a nerve wracking process. And um just because I'm you know, I'm a perfectionist, so I'm trying to make it the right do it. So then I'm just like, man, I just gotta make it authentic. Cause that's what people people, you know, love the things that I do because I just try to be as authentic as possible. So just let me make it authentic. Let me not make it too perfect because 
I think one of the biggest things that I get is when I say something, people always want to question. I don't want to say always, but people question what I say, like question your authority. Like, do you have a degree in therapy or do you have a degree in this? I'm like, oh, would that make me any more knowledgeable if I had a degree? I mean, I, granted, you would have a little more treatments and, and little bits and pieces here and there. But I feel like the experience is the best teacher, it's the best knowledge. And and um, so I just I, I relate to that being in process and gaining that experience and um, I do mentoring. So it really helps with with my process of gaining a little bit more insight and knowledge on different things. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you know, being in my process of writing a book, how do you separate what you put on Twitter from the things that you put in your book or do they kind of mesh sometimes? Because I have great thoughts, great, powerful thoughts that I put in my book and I'm like, no, nah, I can't tweet that out. And then I'm like, maybe I should tweet that out to like, like copyright it, but I don't, I don't know how that works. So how, how is your process from like, you know, deciding what to, you know, put on Twitter and what to keep for the book? Or is it just like, this is like more long form. So I'm going to keep it for the book. Um, so we have no shortage of ideas, so we don't have to save anything for anything. We are tapped into a source that's infinite and mm. that connection it is all supposed to pour and flow with unlimited abundance. That's the one thing, right? Um, beyond that, Twitter's a great source to test thought. It's a great source to test word choice. It's a great source to test sentence structure, mm -hmm. right? Twitter is an immediate feedback um, and that feedback signals something. Mm -hmm. In my personal writing or in my writing that is strictly uh, for book purposes, um, it is the best sentence for the message wins. So Twitter mm -hmm. may have some poetry or some, some song or some frankness, right? And long form, the book stuff, it is all about the context of that message, right? And how do these sentences complement the overall messaging? Twitter is so short that I don't have an overall messaging. Well, I do have an overall messaging for my brand, right? But these are more micro thoughts that can exist on their own, can be writing prompts for other people. They can be things that I can come back to. They can be. Um, you know, just just uh, what I like to call uh, micro deposits, right? Mm. Um, but also, well, you know, that's 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 really just my thought there. Um, I don't think there's overlap, right? Because say say that um, this is something I did as an early writer, say that you write something on Twitter and it's just a passive common thought to you, but it gets reactions that you did not expect, right? Mm -hmm. Now you see that this is a topic or theme that can be delved further, right? Like can, mm -hmm. can be um, expanded further. And then the, ex the expansion, I might just leave that in the book form. Right. They can have the tweet. They had the tweet. But the expansion is in the book form. Um, my book, I Got You, is a great example of that. Right. Um, it was common themes because, again, we're, we're, we're writers for we, we have a message for the mess in this age. We are writers for our time and our people. So mm -hmm. a lot of it is taking these themes that we make popular and maybe breaking it down. Um, in ways that we can digest and use. So um, sometimes, you know, like I said, they complement. Um, but but again, my process, the the expanded, the the overall message that is the book stuff, and then Twitter again. That's the micro deposits. That's the oh, that's a good line. I could share that. You get what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah, and I, I, I like and I like that piece, the message. I'm like, man, that's that's nice. I like that. We, we, we messengers for the mess in this age. That's it. I like that. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, being that you've uh, seen Twitter over time, you've seen it over the years. Um, what do you think is the most effective way to like grow your platform? Because I'm like 
new to Twitter. I just really started like last November and I'm really trying to grow my platform. And, um, what would you say is the most effective way to like build? I'm, I'm learning like commenting and having conversations with other people really helps, you know, it really helps build the platform. But what would you say is something that you've seen really helps grow your platform? I mean, you, 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 are doing well because it's just good content. Mm. And, um, I think the best way to, so here are some tangible things um, that I used early on. I would do 10 tweets a day and I would space mm. them out between 9 and 11 a.m. East Coast time. Right? Mm. Then I would get off that and I just did that consistently each day. It was called Thoughts for the Day. Um, and that, mes- that methodology worked. Um, the app has changed so much over the years. There were hashtags at one point, trending topics that you can dive into, right? But mm. the biggest thing to me is consistency of thought and messaging. People follow that. So it's, 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 it's this theory and screenwriting, right? Which is like you write the pilot episode and then episode two, they want to see the same thing they saw in the pilot, but expanded on. They don't want to see a whole new story. They don't want five new characters, mm. anything. They want to see the same elements of the pilot. They just want to expand it on. Then you could get them to probably episode five, right? But mm. with your tweets, it is very simple. My, my themes are very simple. Um, relationships, love, wellness, well-being. Um, and authenticity. So with authenticity, mm-hmm. with, the, with authenticity, you can have some of those sharper messages. You can have some of those shorter messages. You can have some of those poetic messages that don't even have answers. They just spark thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. You can have uh, questions. You can have a lot, right? And then the other ones, they have layers and subtop- subtopics and themes. But overall, I think that's what people know that they can come to my page four, right? Mm. Um, and I set the tone with this, you know, let's just hug somebody today. So anytime mm-hmm. yeah. I think of my energy, I want it to be that energy, right? So Twitter, to me, the channels people go to and vacillate, like you have those people who are always going to have pop culture energy. They're always going to reflect what's on the blogs. They're always going to reflect what's in, uh, you know, then you got your sports people. So you just mm. think about, right? Um, if you identify with wellness, then you just start thinking of that. Another great thing is list. People love list. Don't think of mm. it as thread. don't think of it as a thread. Think of it as a list. Um, I like to make the differentiator because um, use numbers. Eight topics that blah blah blah. Uh, ten things that I do in the morning. Seven mm. things that um, I said that you know I've got like. When we when we start using these number type things and creating lists, um, people digest them, they save them, they share them, they bookmark them, they screenshot them, um, they steal them. Uh, mm. <laughs> but what all those actions are are uh, people utilizing it, you know? So I would say those things are, are most important. Um, and, and again, it's the consistency of, of thought. So pick a window where you are most active. Mm. Man, that was that was some good game. I, I really appreciate it because I I'm like, man, I, I need some some real wisdom from somebody who's really done it. Um, I feel like Instagram is. Mind you, people don't understand different platforms. Some people don't understand any platform, you know, but Instagram is kind of straightforward to me. Twitter it was like a whole different type of. um type of ball game um but i did see that they released a lot of information about um you know what works what creates the most engagement but you don't get those intangible like nuggets unless you really talk to somebody who's been in it for a while but everybody can tell you how to grow instagram i can tell you a whole different thing because i didn't seen it you know what i'm saying and i know you can as well with your large platform on instagram so it's just those intangible nuggets i did want to ask you about um you know, having a bestseller, um, what's one of those ways that, um, you can like 
bring your community together in order to like sell a good amount of books. I mean, that's just something that I'm interested in writing my book. I, I watched a video on YouTube and the lady was talking about compiling the email list and um, reaching out to the people in your phone and, and having them leave a review and then the, doing the first day. I don't know, like what, what what's the game on um, or what's some information that you've accrued over time that you could share with us about um, being able to make sure your book is, is, is out there and, and, and doing good numbers. So, it's a beautiful question in the sense that um, we all want our work to perform to its greatest potential. Mm. Because of who you are, I can't answer the question without including the manipulation that happens with mm. these and with the sellers. Okay? Um, let's start with the truer aspect, all right? The, uh, the aspect that I follow, and I'm not trying to pit myself against anyone or any of that, right? But I believe in the core 1000. Um, have you ever heard of this method? Mm -mm. So um, you want to get 1000 true fans, right? And you want to have their email, their mailing address, their text number, right? But however you accrue it, you want to have those 1,000 true fans. Now, you want to hopefully engage, serve, and provide enough value to where this core 1,000 people wants to spend $25 with you each quarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you also would like this core 1000 to be your true ambassadors in the world. So you serve them on Twitter, you serve them on Instagram, you serve them in email, you serve them through product, you serve them through course. And ultimately, this service points towards a goal that is important to you, mm. right? You announce mm. the goal to this core 1000 because of your service that goal is now important to them let's say it's in my first book and you want to maximize your sales you'll say hey i'm releasing this book on amazon it will be released on x date and I am you can do pre-sales you can you know do sales that day but here's where it can get um, to where, to where, um, and again, I'm using the word manipulation, not in the sick, sinister, uh, Jafar and Aladdin type mode. Okay. Mm. On Amazon, the bestsellers list is a hourly list. Hmm. Mm -hmm. If you direct your core 1000 to buy at 9 a.m. through 10 a.m. or through 11 a.m. when you've been serving them, right? Say, hey, my book will be live at 9 a.m. Some people are going to buy it at midnight because they're going to be excited. But my book will be live at 9 a.m. They buy in this window. Guess whose book is going to be listed on the best sellers list during that hour? Mm -hmm. You. Now, depending on how you list and title your book, there are different bestsellers lists. Mm. Now, there are harder ones to get on, the nonfiction, the James Patterson joint. But if you go to interpersonal childhood communications and you list your book under that, it's probably going to be easier to get a top five bestseller. Right? So what I do is I go look at people's book classifications. How did they list it? Now, mm. what most people want to do, this is the manipulation. What most people want to do is they just want to get on any bestseller, right? So they might list their book under something that doesn't have anything to do with, but it's not a, it's not a category that gets, you know, releases every week. So you can get a bestseller, you can screenshot it, you can post that. People don't care what list it is. They just like seeing number mm. one. I'm not advocating for this. I'm explaining 
the metal mm. behind the list. Yes. New York Times. If you're an independent author, you are not going to be eligible for the list because they only work with X amount of publishers who are big box publishers. And for the New York Times, you have to have what they call um, a certain level of distribution. So you could have mm. sold 10,000 books independently, right? You contacted a bookstore, they loved it. You held an event, did this, blah, blah, blah. But if it's not sold by their aggregate, meaning their targets, their their uh, books a million, their Barnes and Noble, if it's not through there, then you're not going to make the list, right? Mm. But, and again, this, so you asked a very, very, uh, a question that is worth like a whole hour almost. Um, yeah. But, because there's so many layers, but I just want you to understand that um, that a lot of that is um, I'm trying to explain it that doesn't make it sound as crazy as it is. <laughs> uh, no, this is good stuff. But I will say this. I will say this. Um, if you focus on serving your core 1000, you will always have books that perform well. You will always have consistent book sales that provides you the time to study, learn, grow, travel, and reinvest back into your community. And then you will be able to produce more products. Mm. If you focus on Core 1000, you'll get a Core 2000. It'll turn into a Core 3000. It'll turn into a Core 5000. It'll turn into a Core 10,000. Mm. Do you understand how that happens? Mm continuous service. My first book, I had a core 1000. On my eighth book, I have a core 8000. And it could be even bigger. But you got to understand it's all about who is in that, who is serving, and who is advocating. Right? Um, that's the best way to get a bestseller. Now, your publisher is going to matter. right? It's easier to get on these traditional bestsellers lists if you are working with a, one of the top three publishers. You know, your Random, Penguin, your Simon. Right? Mm. It is possible to get on your Ebony or Essence or your Blavities or your Grios or other type of lists, right? It's also possible to create your own bestsellers list, right? Mm. Uh, and this is something that my company is very interested in doing just because the books we read and consider the best are different than those editors who have no tangible correlation to our community. Mm. Different grain. Um, hopefully I haven't been talking in circles. What I'm trying to nah. say that um, yeah, the, 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 it just depends on what list you're trying to make. But here's my suggestion. Be less concerned with these, uh, you know, you know, Jay said, um, Jay Z said, mm -hmm. uh, we were praising Billboard, but we were young. Now we look at Billboard like, is you dumb? Because the idea that you're doing it for that list or you're doing it for their recognition is um, it is a it's slight kind of productive to the art, yeah. Yeah, bro, it's a slight towards all the studying and all the submitting that you've done to people who perfected their knowledge and all the resources that you've read and, and, and the actual journey that you walk. It's a slight, my brother. So mm. why would we, why measure it? Why measure yourself to that? Now, granted, yes, I've made bestsellers list and it's been cool, but I promise you it has not been due to manipulation. It has not been due to paid ad. It has not been due to um, trying to do uh, coordinated like things like that no it's mm. been due to health it's been through to pride in my product and my service it's been through authenticity it's been through consistency it's you know it's, it's been through those things right and it's also been through a certain amount of not caring about that right mm. because it's like whether i make a bestseller or not when i before i wrote my first book i wanted to write 50 mm. so I got too many shots anyway, but also mm -hmm. like if, if, if I just care about the message and being effective, it's like, that's going to take care of itself. So. Um, mm -hmm. Prime example, Paulo Coelho, his book, The Alchemist, mm -hmm. one of 
powerful yes. actual books in the world, right? There, there's a story about it being printed in his native tongue for a year and not selling. He was dropped from his publisher. They said the book sucked. They said it wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. It was adapted into another language, taken by another publisher, and now it's 50 plus million copies sold around the world. It was his second book ever written. Do you know that he's written 50? Mm, no. You know what I'm so it's like, and I'm grateful that he's written 50 because it's like, imagine if he was just doing it to sell 50 million books. Mm. We'd have been cheated out of so many lessons and thoughts and it's it just all these things. Mm. So anyway, um, how do you do that? Again, focus on your core 1000 because that is the true essence of audience building. Right. And if you can nurture that, I guarantee you, you will not be a starving artist and you will not be somebody who has to pimp themselves to be heard. Mm. I love that. I love that, man. And I I appreciate that. It really just helps you understand, like, man, things are so much deeper than with me. And I've definitely seen that working in. um the publicist sector, you know, I was, um, a, you know, I had a lot of internships uh, working for different publicists back when I was in college. You know, I saw like, hey, man, you think this person's got this article because of this? And it's a whole nother thing. Like it ain't got nothing to do with the work. So that manipulation is definitely a real thing. But I know um, you have another engagement after this. So I just wanted to end it off with this last question. I wanted to ask you what phase of life, what would you, what would you say this phase of life is called that you're in right now? What would you, what would you title it? If you could give it one word or a few words, what would you call this phase in your life right now? I have to quote Ta-Nehisi Coates. And he says, um, before I could escape, before I could discover I first had to survive. Mm. And this phase of life is called discovery. Mm. Discovery. I like that. I'm enjoying it, brother. I'm enjoying it. I love that. Rob, you'll see you, man. I appreciate you coming on the show with us and blessing us with the knowledge, the wisdom, and just great conversation, man. This is powerful. This is much needed. This is long anticipated. And this is the one. I really appreciate you coming on with us, man. Let's run back for a part two. I'm saying it now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whenever you got time. But this is one on one with the Mod the Poet. We appreciate y'all for tuning in. It's Rob Hill Sr., Mod the Poet, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.